Hi, so my name is Nathan Wall, and uh, before we get started, I'd like to mention, based on uh, the previous talk, I have actually written a CSS4 selector engine called Quicksand. So you can Google that, Quicksand CSS4, if you want to check that out. Uh, but today I'm going to be talking about high-integrity JavaScript, and um, essentially what that means is how to write code that always works under any situations, and we're going to mix in a little bit of security considerations with that. Before I get started, though, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. I work at AppNexus, um, and I am on the UI team. Been there for about a year now. Um, also, when I was eight, I made an unassisted triple play in baseball. <laughs> so that was the highlight of my sporting career. And probably the reason for that is because that same year, I started programming in this language. Uh, this is QBasic, if, you, if you're not familiar with it. But after that, my, my sports career kind of ended, and I spent most of my time doing this. Um, so in 1995, when Brendan Eich was designing JavaScript, it was a very rushed job. In fact, he claims to have created JavaScript in the span of about 10 days. It was so rushed that uh, he knew that he was probably not going to get uh, everything in the language in his first pass, and that there might be some, some ways that people wanted to add to the language or change the language, and so he made it highly malleable. You can change just about anything in the language, and it's a really fun part about the language, but it's also uh, a little dangerous. Um, so here's an example of a place where, in my own code, I've run into a problem with JavaScript's malleability. Uh, here you see I have a set date function, and we are calling date.parse to get a timestamp for the date that's being passed in, and then we're checking to see if it's nan, and then we're running some sort of code based on that, maybe like showing an error message because you weren't supposed to pass in a date that didn't make any sense, and otherwise we're going to run some other code. So it seems pretty straightforward. Uh, this is an example of what date.parse outputs for the built-in date.parse. Um, if you pass in null, you get nan. If you pass in an empty string, you get nan. So in both of these cases, you'd go through this top uh, if condition. If you pass in the number 2005, you get this giant number, which corresponds, I think, to the end of 2004. I'm not really sure why that is. But if you're using date.js, this is what you get. When you do date.parse on null, you get null, not nan. And you do date.parse on empty string, you also get null. And on 2005, you get null. Uh, this creates a problem for the above code because null is not nan. When you run is nan on null, you don't get true. You get false. So actually, uh, if you pass in one of these strings or one of these top two that's not supposed to really be considered a, a, a date, uh, using date.js, we'd run the code that goes here instead of this top condition. Um, so JavaScript's malleability can create a problem where if you're, if you're writing code that uh, you're not using date.js at, at one point in your code, and you set up conditions like this, and then you include date.js later, uh, your conditions are going to change. So we want to talk about ways to, to handle this better. Um, traditionally, there's been three approaches, or really two approaches traditionally, um, to handling JavaScript's malleability. The first approach is just don't worry about it. Uh, just assume that you have a safe environment uh, going in. Don't do anything to try to detect that, whether the environment's changed or not, and, and just work with JavaScript the way it's supposed to be. Uh, this is by far the most common approach, and uh, you, uh, it sort of goes also along with the teaching that you shouldn't modify the built-ins, and you shouldn't sort of change the environment, uh, which is, is fine. It's, it's a really helpful and good teaching. But uh, on, the, on the other end, you do limit creativity. You lose the, the ability uh, to change object.prototype if you wanted to, and if you had a good reason to in your project. Um, so you sort of lose the intention of JavaScript to be flexible and malleable the way, to, the way that it was originally designed to be. Um, also, if you're doing this way, you, you have no guarantee that your stuff's going to work. So someone might come along and change the environment in a third-party third party code that you're including, um, and your stuff might break without you realizing it. So the second approach, and this is becoming more common, is to lock the environment uh, using a, a subset of JavaScript um, 
this is uh, commonly used subscript of JavaScript is uh, known as SES, which stands for Secure ECMAScript. And basically, this approach will take third-party scripts and limit them to, to a subset of JavaScript that it knows is safe and prevent things from being done that you don't want to be done. Uh, the new newest version of ECMAScript, ECMAScript 5, makes this much more possible than it ever was before to lock down the environment so that it can't be changed. This is a, a really good approach to take if you're an application developer but if you're a library developer or you're developing third-party scripts that someone else might be using, this isn't an approach I think you should take because uh, this is a decision that should be made on the application level. Libraries shouldn't choose to lock down the environment. Application developers should choose whether they want the environment to be locked or not. So the third approach, and this is what I'm gonna be advocating for, is write code that always works. This is what I call high integrity. High integrity JavaScript is going to work under any situation that you give it, um, and it's just gonna be really good. So when should you care about high integrity? Um, I have a quote from Mark Miller, and uh, this is important to get across at the beginning. So this is about sort of these, these practices of writing JavaScript in this way. Mark Miller, who works at Google, he, uh, he's on the ECMAScript committee, and he developed Kaha, which is one of the uh, it's used uh, to sort of do the second approach that I was talking about, to lock down the environment. But talking about sort of this high integrity approach, he said this, at first for those used to JavaScript, or even just conventional OO, the style needed is very counterintuitive and awkward. It goes against the grain of what the language tries to make convenient. But amazingly, it's possible, and one even gets used to it after a while. So that's where we're going. Uh, this is not easy to do, especially if you're used to working with JavaScript in, in the traditional ways. But you can learn to do it, and it can, you can get used to it. Um, having said that, it's important to note that the techniques I'm gonna show you are not for every project. Some of the techniques you may wanna use on one project, uh, you may not wanna use all of them on the same project. Um, it depends on the level of security and integrity that you're going for in your project and what your specific needs are. So you can pick and choose which of the approaches I'm gonna, or which of the techniques I'm gonna show you that uh, would be most suitable for your project. So keep that in mind. So times when you should care about high integrity and be thinking about it is when you're using third party code because like I showed you in the date.js example, you, third party code could change your environment. Uh, also, things that you need to consider, especially on the, the security aspect, uh, browser extensions are always possible on your site. So even if you're not uh, yourself using third-party code, uh, someone else's browser might be including third-party code. Also, if you're using some analytics service or pulling in third-party code from a CDN or something like that, you never know if the CDN might be hacked or if the analytics service might be compromised. So even if you have a secure code base, you don't know that third-party code you're including is necessarily secure. Um, so in the security respects, just keep that in mind. Also, when you're writing third-party code, I think this is more important if you're developing libraries or uh, just third-party code in general that people are going to be using. Uh, it's helpful to keep these things in mind. And finally, like I've said, applications re requiring a high level of security, things like banks, social networks, email clients, uh, things dealing with personal information that you don't want to get out. So these are the goals that we're going for in this talk. Um, we could be a little bit more strict. We're gonna be pretty strict, but we could be a little bit more strict. And if, if your specific application requires a speci uh, more strict approach, that's okay, you could do that. But here's the goal that I'm going for in, in my talk and in most of the things that I develop that I'm using HiJS. Uh, we want to design the script in such a way that it will run consistently given the same initialization environment. So if you uh, run a script, um, when the script initializes, that's sort of the, the uh, time we want to, when we want to capture the JavaScript environment that our script exists in. And if the environment changes later, after our script initializes, then we still want to function as if we had, uh, as if the environment was in the state when our script initialized. The reason I've chosen this approach, rather than a more strict approach, which would be we want our, our script to work this, uh, the same under any environment, 
no matter how the environment is when we initialize. The reason I've taken this approach is because I think it is helpful to give application developers the ability to change the order of scripts in order to give them a higher integrity level. So for instance, if you want to do any sort of monitoring of what's going on in, in the environment, you, can, uh, you would be able to insert a testing script at the very beginning that would uh, hook onto the built-ins and observe what's going on. But then scripts that come later would still, uh, would still maintain uh, uh, the, the way that it was intended to work according to the order the scripts were loaded. And, and second, our goal is to leave the environment in a state that functions observably identically to the way it did when we got access to it. So I'm not opposed to changing the environment. I'm not telling you not to change the environment in this talk. Uh, I am telling you that we should leave it in a state that no one can tell whether we've changed it or not. So some of the things that I'm going to be proposing here are a little radical and different from how you're working with JavaScript. But I just want to get you thinking about what's possible. And the language is, is really flexible and dynamic. And it's amazing what you can do with the language. So I want to get you thinking about that. So this is where we're going. We're going to talk about how to achieve high integrity by talking about, first, we're going to get up to speed on Atmosphere 5. ECMAScript is the official name of the specification for JavaScript, and ECMAScript 5 is the latest version. Um, so I'm imagining not everybody in this room knows, knows ECMAScript 5 really well because it's still not used very much. Uh, there's a couple reasons for that. Probably the primary reason is because it's not supported in IE8. And it came out in, uh, at the end of 2009, December 2009. So it's been out for a few years now. Uh, it is supported in IE9 and in the latest Firefox, Chrome, and Safari. Um, so you can start using this now, but you just need to keep in mind that it's not going to work on IE8. I'm going to, in this talk, though, I'm going to specifically um, restrict the talk to Atmosphere 5. Um, and the reason I'm doing that is because Atmosphere 5 provides a lot more tools for securing the environment than were available in the previous version. So uh, not everything that I'm going to talk about today will work on Internet Explorer 8. Uh, I know that doesn't fit everybody's projects, but it does fit some projects, and it will fit your project in the future. Uh, then we're going to talk about general purpose, how to write general purpose code, how to achieve private variables in JavaScript, and then finally, how to guard the internal state. Once you have private variables, we need to know how to hold on to them. So, just a brief overview of some of the things I'm going to use in Atmosphere 5. This is no, by no means exhaustive of what's in Atmosphere 5, but the, the things that I'm going to be mentioning, here's what we have. Object.create. This allows you to pass in a prototype, and it will create an object based on with, with the prototype of whatever you passed in. So for instance, in this example, we have the A object, it's just a, an empty object, and then we say B equals object.create, and we pass in A. What that does is it creates a B object that inherits from A, and then A naturally inherits from object.prototype, and object.prototype doesn't inherit from anything. So this allows you to easily set up prototypical inheritance uh, in, in, a, in a nice and seamless way. Also, you can pass in null. If you don't want an object to inherit from object.prototype, this is really helpful, especially if you're trying to achieve high integrity. So here we're saying object.create null, that creates an A object which doesn't inherit from object.prototype. So you get a clean slate. Define property allows you to do a number of things. Specifically, what I'm going to be talking about is how to define getters and setters. So define property, you can use it to define an accessor property, which is a property that has a getter or a setter. This is an example of what it looks like. You will say define property on a specific object, in this case the A object, tell it the property name, foo, and then state uh, what the getters and setters are. So when, that means when I try to retrieve foo, run this function, and when I try to set foo, run this function. So in this example, you, say, you see a.foo equals bar. The setter is going to be called because this is setting the property foo. So it would say foo equals value. It stores that variable foo to be bar. Then when we try to retrieve a.foo, it calls the getter. So it would return foo plus this extra added to the property. So this is what it would return, bar underscore extra. Also undefined property, one thing I need to mention, because we're, we're going to mention this a little later, uh, there's, there's two kinds of descriptors that you can pass in. So descriptor is the name for this object that you pass in as the third argument to it. 
There's two kinds of descriptors that you can pass in. You can pass in data descriptors or accessor descriptors. Uh, data descriptor defines your, your regular property that's not a getter and setter. Accessor descriptors define getters and setters. So you'll see that the difference between the two is data descriptors have these attributes value and writable. Value would be the value of the property. And the accessor descriptor, instead of those, it has a getter and a setter that it defines. Uh, one important thing that you're going to see that we're going to talk about later is you can't mix these two. For instance, you can't have a descriptor. You can't pass in here a get, a set, and a value property. That's not allowed because it just doesn't make sense. There's only uh, two kinds of descriptors you can define, and you have to stick to one of these two. Object.freeze allows you to lock an object so that it can't be modified. Uh, this is really helpful. Um, especially if you are going to be handing off an object to someone you don't trust and they might, you don't want them to modify your object or change it in any way, but you just want them to be able to read it. This basically creates a read-only object. And finally, bind. Probably you're more familiar with this one because it exists in a lot of libraries, including jQuery, uh, but now it's actually in ECMAScript 5. So you can, you can use bind to create a, a function from a method by binding the method to a specific this context. So that was a lot of words. Here's the example. We have, we're storing the for each method from array.prototype, and then we're, we've got this uh, array called foo, we, and then we're gonna define this function called for each foo by binding the for each method to the foo object. So now anytime this function is called, this, ret this bind returns a new function, Anytime this function is called, it's going to be called in the context of the foo object. So if I say for each foo, uh, for each item, just log it, uh, that's exactly the same thing as doing this. It's exactly the same as saying foo dot for each, but the, the foo dot is sort of built into the function. All right, so how to write general purpose code? Um, storing built-ins. This is a pretty common practice. You've probably seen something like this before. Uh, we're, we're running this function immediately, passing in the built-in object, string, and date, and then we're also uh, pulling in this extra argument undefined to store undefined because it can be rewritten. So we're, uh, it, at least in, in a certain scope, it can. So we're pulling in this, this undefined um, just so that we have reference to an actual undefined that we know isn't gonna change. Uh, this is pretty common, but actually these next few lines is not so common, and I, I sort of want to question that. We, people, people will commonly pull these in because they know that they can be changed later on by some other script, so we want to have a copy of them so that we, we know that we have the real deal. But why not copy date.parse so that we know that we have the real one and date.js isn't going to mess it up later? And why not copy keys and get on proper names or whatever other properties that you're, or whatever other functions that you're going to use? Um, in addition, one other thing that uh, people commonly will do and makes a lot of sense is run some code like this. Um, if you're doing this, and I'm sure that you are, this push method, how do you know that this hasn't been changed? You're, you're making an assumption that the environment hasn't changed and that the push, push method is reliable, but the push method can be changed in JavaScript. So it's, it's a little bit interesting that people will commonly do something like this at the top, but then they go on to rely on other built-ins in JavaScript without thinking about it. We're gonna talk about how to address this issue in particular later. All right, so naming collisions. Um, if you're trying to write general purpose code, this is code that can be used under any situation. You need to think about when naming collisions might occur. So here in this example, this is a highly contrived example, but it was the best I could come up with in a short amount of space. We have an each key function that's being passed an object and a callback. And essentially what we want to do is go over each property in this object that's passed in and execute the callback function, passing in a few things. We're going to pass in the name of the key or the name of the property, uh, the value of that property, and then whether or not it's an own property. An own property means it's defined on the object rather than on the prototype. And in order to find out if it's an own property, we're doing obj.has own property and passing in the key name. That's how you would normally do it. So in this example down here, though, we run into a problem. If someone tries to use your each key function that you created on this object, we're going to have a bug. Can anybody spot it? Yeah, yeah, has own property. 
has on property is the problem. Here in this object, we're defining has on property to be this string. So it's a string now, it's not a function. So when we try to call obj.has on property, it's not possible to call it because you can't execute a string. So this, this will give you a type error. Um, so dealing with the naming collision is don't depend on object.prototype or any prototypes for that matter. Write functionally. And here's how that would look. This is the each key function redefined to be written functionally so that it can work on any object, even if it has a has on property property. So here we're, we're instead of saying obj.has on property, we're saying has on and passing in the object and the key. The has on function is defined this way. We store the has on property method um, from object.prototype. And then inside the has on function, we say has on property dot call, so call has on property with the context of obj passing in the key. All right, so this is another example um, where you, you might sort of want to think about writing functionally from, from sort of a different angle. In this example, this is, a, this is a common utility function you might have seen in some libraries, pluck. It allows you to pass in an array and a property name, and it will pluck out all the properties um, from each item in the, in the array. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to map the array, it's going to loop over the array, and return, uh, for, for each item in the array, it's going to return whatever is at that property name. The problem with this, well, before we get to the problem, here's, here's an example of it. So this is a contrived example of when you might want to use it if you have, uh, and sort of to help you see how it works, if you have uh, these three input elements with three different names, you could pass them in in an array and then say pluck out the value property from each of those items. And it would return this array with the, the value from first name, middle name, and last name, which would give you an array saying William, How William Howard Taft. So what happens if you try to execute pluck on this object, though? When you call document elements a tag name, uh, this, would, this would be if you wanted to pluck out the value of every single input on the page, um, you're going to get this error. You get a type error saying that node list has no method map. The reason for that is because document.getElements.tag name doesn't return an array, it returns a node list, and node lists don't have a map method. So this pluck function isn't written generically. It works on only real arrays. It doesn't work on things that are array-like. Uh, for instance, uh, node lists and jQuery objects, because they have a different signature. Also, arguments objects would have this problem. So in order to, to make this generic, we want to support objects that are array-likes. Objects that look like arrays, but they're not true arrays. So one easy way to do that is, again, we're going to follow the, a similar pattern to, to what we did before. We're going to store the, the map method, and we're going to define a map function instead. Of using, instead of using the map method, we're going to define a map function. The map function takes any kind of array-like and a callback, and it's going to say map.call on the array-like the callback. Uh, the array prototype methods are defined in a, in a really awesome way that they work on objects that aren't true arrays, they work even on array-likes. So this, is, this makes it really easy to do. We can just call the map method on an array-like and it'll work. Um, and here we would call, instead of saying array.map, we just say map on the array. Now this is, uh, this is a good solution, but we can do better. One problem with this solution is we do have to depend on call staying the same. Maybe someone's changed call to do something that you don't want. So we are going to talk about that. So also another thing that you, you may find yourself doing is writing several of these types of uh, functions in this way, has own and map and everything that you need to use. So it's also helpful to sort of abstract that process. And in the, in the process of abstracting, abstracting this, uh, we also are able to harden it so that it doesn't matter whether, whether someone changes the call method or not. And here's how you would do it. Um, we're going to store the has own property method, and we're going to store the call method from function.prototype. And then you can say uh, that we're going to define has own to be call.bind on has own property. In other words, we're going to take the call method and bind it to the has own property method. What that does is essentially when you do call.bind, or when you do.bind in general, it would reverse 
uh, you can think of it as sort of reversing these two. So it would be like saying has on property dot call. In other words, has on is defined as being has on property dot call. So it sort of sticks them together. So this is functionally identical to this. Also, we could do this for uh, several different functions, and it's just a really easy way to, to go ahead and, and get turn a method into a function. So I sort of call this process lazy bind. It's also commonly known as uncurry this. Essentially, lazy bind converts a method into a function with this as its first argument. So in this case, we're calling lazy bind on array.prototype.slice on array.prototype.map, it takes these methods and it turns them into functions that whatever the first argument is, it, it'll be the this context of the function. And this would be one way to implement lazy bind. Um, again, you would have to depend on bind remain, remaining neutral. And we can, we can do a little better. So if we say, if we store the call method and the bind method, we can say bind dot bind to call. And essentially what this does, remember, the bind essentially reverses the order of things. So this is sort of like getting you call dot bind, which is what we want. We want a function that when we call it, it calls call dot bind. So this is functionally equivalent to this. And if you want to do it in one line, you can. This is something you might see if you look into this stuff, function dot prototype dot bind dot bind on function.prototype.call, that's the same thing as this, just in one line instead of three. That's how you get a lazy bind. Also, one more tip is be aware of the prototype chain. So in this example, we're using define property, passing, it, passing in the A object and this foo property and a getter and a setter like I showed you before. Uh, one thing you might want to think, of, think about when you're using define property or other built-in methods or uh, methods that, that are in some sort of library is whether or not you want to inherit from object.prototype. In this example, inheriting from object.prototype will give you a problem. So the descriptor here, since we're doing object.prototype.value equals gotcha, the descriptor here inherits from object.prototype and inherits this value property. Since you can't have a get, a set, and a value on a descriptor, this will throw a type error. So if, if some code somewhere adds some value property to the to object of prototype, this gives you an error. So one way that you can guard against that is instead of passing in an object which inherits from object of prototype, just always pass in an object which inherits from null. Remember, you can do that by uh, saying object.create and passing in null. This is an implementation of a function called define that would work exactly like define property, but instead of uh, taking your descriptor with its full inheritance, whatever that might be, it changes its inheritance to inherit from null. So we create this D object that inherits from null, then we copy over all the keys from the descriptor, and then we call define property again. This way we know we're not inheriting from anything, and this is probably the way most people expect to use define property. All right, so private variables. Um, private variables, I, I don't, I'm running short on time, so I'm not gonna spend time uh, trying to convince you why you might want to use private variables, but there are valid use cases, and if you want to use private variables, you need to know how to achieve them in JavaScript because they don't come baked into the language. They are possibly going to come baked into the language in ECMAScript 6, the next version of JavaScript. This is one thing that Brendan Ike has floated out there, um, where essentially you can use these at names to, to refer to private variables. Uh, you would. In this example, we're defining a constructor, passing in a private variable. It, uh, in this, in this uh, sort of sugared up version of this class, the private variable would automatically be assigned to an instance um, if it's passed in this way. And then we could just return it inside this get name function. So this is possibly the future for ECMAScript 6. Still a little debate's going on about that. But whether or not this is coming into ECMAScript 6, uh, we still have to deal with it now. Uh, there are applications where we want to use private variables and we need to know how to do it. And also, once it's even in ECMAScript 6, we're still gonna have to support legacy browsers for a while. So one common way to try to achieve private variables is the underscore pattern. You see this a lot. Uh, essentially what we're doing is we're setting this underscore property 
as sort of a pseudo private property. It's, it's, the underscore is just meant to, to say to other developers that this is intended to be private. You probably shouldn't access it from the outside. But it's just a notation. It doesn't really make it private. So problems with this might be naming collisions. If you have a long inheritance chain, you have to make sure that your private variables all have unique names, which is something that you're not probably not used to from other languages. Also, you don't really have true encapsulation. If you're intending for, the, for these variables to be really private for one reason or the other, you don't really have that. So another common pattern that you might see is the neoclassical pattern. And the neoclassical pattern uh, sort of allows you to have real private variables in one sense, um, but the trade-offs are that you don't get to use prototypal inheritance, at least not fully, because you have to have these methods defined inside the, the constructor so that they have access to the private variables. Um, and also, we don't have class private variables. And class private variables are really important. That's what we want. I'm gonna show you an example of, uh, that, that will hopefully drive home that point. So this is the bank account example. This is derived from an, uh, an example that Mark Miller used. And essentially, this is what we want. We want a class called bank account that when we create it, we create a bank account with a certain amount of money in it. So Jane has $1,000, Mike has $400. And then we're gonna call Mike.deposit from Jane $200 and we get the new balances for their accounts. So implementing this in the underscore pattern is pretty straightforward. We would say this dot underscore balance equals balance to store the private variable for underscore balance. Um, and then we can just return the underscore balance when the get balance method is called. And then when we do deposit, we would just say for this uh, bank account instance, add the amount that I want to be deposited. And from the whatever the from account is, subtract the amount. Problems with this though are that you really don't have encapsulation. If this bank account object is intended to, to really have a private balance that can only be changed through this deposit interface, you don't have that with this. So the neoclassical pattern, we can attempt to do it because neoclassical pattern does give us private variables, but we actually run into a problem when you try to do the bank account example. Here's what it is. In the deposit method, you're passing in the from uh, instance of the bank account and the amount. It's easy to add to this instance's amount because we can just add to whatever balance is. Balance is passed in at the beginning. It's a private variable to this uh, instance. We can add to it, but there's no way to access the from balance. There's the, the closure that's created by this instance is uh, private to each instance. It's, it's not shared across the class. So in this case, this is, uh, this is instance private variables. What we really want is what's called class private variables. In class private variables, uh, don't think static variables. They're different from static private variables. Class private variables are what most languages provide. Uh, in Java, for instance, would provide class private variables. These are variables that can be accessed across instances of the same class. So here's a little diagram. Uh, here's instance private variables. Um, this is sort of my attempt to diagram this. The dotted lines mean, well, the solid lines mean that you can't reach across those borders. So for instance, uh, the public method of instance two can't reach across this border into the private uh, variables of instance one. The dotted lines mean that you can reach across one border. So public methods of, of instance one can reach into the private variables of instance one, but public methods of one instance can't reach into the private variables of another instance. So this is instance private variables. What we want though is class private variables. The borders are around the class this time. So nothing can reach in from the outside of the class, but instances are free to reach across to each other's private variables. So secrets is a library, a micro library, a small script that I developed um, that allows you to have uh, class private variables. It's based on some work by a guy named Brandon Benvey. And uh, I sort of took some of his ideas and cleaned them up and, and put them in this, this library. And essentially what secrets does is that you call secrets.create and you get a function here, I'm calling it S. And when you call that function on an object, you returned a, a secret object, a, a parallel version of, of whatever object you pass in that can only be retrieved by calling S on the object. So in this case, we have obj. This is the public version of the object. We call S and we get this secret object. If you hide S inside a closure and no one else has access to it, then only the code inside that closure is able to retrieve the secret object. 
An object can have multiple secrets. So here we have an S and a T function. And S returns this secret object, while T returns another secret object. I'm going to start moving a little fast, because I have a little more I want to get to. Here we, uh, this, is, this is pretty interesting. Secrets have parallel prototype chains. So in this case, we have a C object that inherits from B, that inherits from A. So the secret of C inherits from the secret of B, which inherits from the secret of A. So we define uh, a foo property on the secret of A, and you can access it on the secret of C, since the secret of C inherits from the secret of A. So this is the bank account example rewritten using secrets. We're creating the secret function. We're uh, calling it on this, the, in, the new instance that's being created for the bank account, uh, and setting the balance, the balance private property on that object. Then we can return the balance private property, again by calling S, which is hidden inside this closure. And finally, when we try to do the deposit method, you can call S on this and change the balance, and you can also call S on from and change the balance. It's also pop possible to do protected variables with secrets, uh, sort of emulate protected variables with secrets. This is an example of that. I'm not going to walk it, through it because I'm short on time, but you can look at it on my slide deck. So this is sort of how secrets works under the hood in ECMAScript 5. In ECMAScript 5, we define a secret key on the object that is hidden from uh, any sort of access to the object. So there's a few ways you could try to access a property. This property is generated randomly. There's a few ways you could try to find the property. One would be by doing a, a for in loop or doing object.keys or object.get on property names. The first two are hidden by making this property non-enumerable. So this property just doesn't show up because it's non-enumerable. That's something allowed in Atmosphere 5. The third way, object.get on property names, is supposed to return all property names, all own property names on an object. But we hide that by changing object.get on property names. We override object.get on property names to return all properties except the secret one. That doesn't matter that much, because even if someone does discover the property, they can not access the secrets because there's a lock on it. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But um, it, it does provide uh, the, the sort of illusion that there is not an extra property on the object. So when you call the, the secret function, these are the steps that it's going to take. It unlocks the lock so that, it, so that it can get access to the secret map. Then it requests the secret map. The secret map is an object that contains a property for each individual secret function. So S would be one of these. It locks the lock right back so that no one else can get access to the secret map. And then it returns the secret map, whatever the specific key is for the function that you're calling. In ES6, one way that this could be implemented is with weak maps. I'm going to gloss over this, but um, know that Secrets was de designed in such a way that it is possible to be forward compatible with ES6 when it does come out. And finally, in, in a short amount of time, I'm going to talk about guarding internal state, because once you actually have private variables, it actually turns out hard to hold on to them. They, they can escape very easily in JavaScript. So in this example, we have Alice and Bob. Alice is trying to create a list that she can hand off to Bob, but no matter what Bob does with that list, she can log what, uh, whatever's added to the list or changed in the list. So she has this object, she gives the list to Bob, but she keeps track of the log somehow. In this case, she's just using console.log. So the, she's got an add method, a get method, and a set method. Uh, and for add and set, she's trying to log what Bob does. And then she's calling send to Bob on her new logged list. So this is one attack that Bob could do on, on, uh, on her implementation. He can actually call the set method. And since the set method doesn't validate whether or not the index is a number, uh, he actually changes the push method on the, on the internal array. So Alice is trying to keep this array internal to the, to the class. And she thinks it's private because it's, it's defined inside. But Bob can actually get access to it by changing the push method to uh, return whatever this is, which would be the array whenever push is called. And then he can call push by saying list.add. And since push is called, he's able to get access to the array. So Alice decides to neutralize the arguments so that when Bo whatever Bob passes in, it has to be a number plus coerces to a number. That way, Bob can't use that attack anymore. But he can use array.prototype.push. He can change array.prototype.push to return to this, just like he did before. And in this case, 
when Alice's code calls push, Bob is able to steal the array. It's stolen in the sto stolen stored in the stolen variable, and then he can change it without Alice getting a log of what changes he makes. And so finally, um, so this is one way that Alice could fix this using lazy bind on the push method to get a push function that she calls on the array. Like we saw before, this way she knows that no matter if push is changed on the array.prototype, she's got a working version of push. And then the last example, um, there's, there's one more attack that Bob can do on this, and it, it's actually a little hard to find, but calling push on an array will actually respect a setter on that array. So here's, the, here's Bob's attack. He defines a zero property on the array that's a setter that steals the, the internal array. So when, when Alice, Alice's code calls push, it looks at that zero index property and it checks to see if it's a setter. Since it's a setter, it executes the setter and the setter is able to steal the internal array. So the, the last uh, step that Alice needs to do to secure this, this implementation is don't be cautious with her built-ins. Instead of using a real array for this, for this uh, internal array, she uses a, uh, a, an array that inherits from null so that Bob can't change anything on the prototype. All right, and that's, uh, that's my talk. I'm out of time. If you have any questions, you can come see me afterwards. Work at AppNexus, we're hiring, so uh, come talk to us at the AppNexus booth. Okay. All right, I've been told that I can take one question, so if, if one person wants to ask a question, we, we have time for that. All right, no question. Uh, oh, there's a question over there. Can you please describe the single man triple play? Could you speak up a little bit? Can you please describe the triple play? The, the triple... Oh, my triple play when I was eight. Uh, so I was on second base, and uh, I caught a fly, or not a fly by, I caught a line drive. And then I tagged the person that was running to second base, and then I stepped on second base and got the person out that was off of second base and running to third. <laughs>